So what I'm going to do is actually start off with, a, with an echo case. And so I want you guys to help interpret this case. And I'm going to ask you at the end uh, what you think the severity of the mitral regurgitation is here. So I've got here uh, a couple of parasternal long axis views, one with color, one zoomed in on the mitral valve. Look at you know, what you can find about the mechanism as well as what you think the severity of the mitral regurgitation is. We've got the long axis views as well, and we've got color across the mitral valve on the four chamber, the two chamber, the three chamber view, and then also a zoomed in parasternal view over in the lower right hand side here. And so if we think about the flow chart that Steve gave us, you know, take a look at, you know, think about the, the, the uh, algorithm that he proposed. Think about how you would apply that for this particular patient. And obviously, I've also got here uh, a, a continuous wave across the mitral valve where you can see the, the mitral regurgitation jet. And then on the right-hand side is your mitral inflow. And the mitral inflow, I think, measured about 1.2. And then here are the actual numbers that were reported on the report itself. All right, so LV end diastolic dimension was 5.1 centimeters, uh, end systolic was 2.9, um, and uh, LA volume on the right hand side, LA st or LVOT stroke volume was 54, and uh, mitral uh, peak E was 112. All right, so the question I've got for the audience here is what's the severity of the mitral regurgitation? And how many of you think it's mild mitral regurgitation? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you think it's moderate mitral regurgitation? Raise your hand. A couple of people. Okay. How many of you think it's severe? Raise your hand. A couple of people. And how many of you say you need more information? All right. So most of you say you need more information. Right. Well, that's, that's what I'm going to ask next. So what is the additional information you want? Was that? whether it's holosystolic or not. So let's take a look. So it's a very eccentric jet, right? And obviously we've got several echo gurus in the room here. So one is it's a very eccentric jet. It's hard to tell if you, I mean, in some of these views, it's hard to even see it, right? But when I go to the long axis view, I mean, Manny, Roberto, any of the echo gurus, give us your insights into this. Uh, we, we, do have it. Um, unfortunately, it was very poor signal. Yes. Oh, this okay. So the yeah, I didn't I didn't bring the pulmonary venous jet because it was a very poor signal, so you couldn't really see it very well. But there was not flow reversal in the pulmonary veins. Yes. Yeah. So so the question he's asking is, uh, in a case like this, can you apply the volumetric technique? Right. Basically, uh, do LVOT stroke stroke volume and compare that to LV stroke volume by 3D echo. Um, you know. That, that's a very good comment. It was not done in this particular case. So if you're sitting here reading the study, I, I think this is an example of a case where, you, you know, how many people are confident in saying there's severe MR here? How many people are concerned that this could be much worse than, they, than or this could be severe, but we're not sure, right? And so I think this, I mean, this case, I think, highlights the fact, yes, there's, there's, some uncertainty here, and if you apply this to the, the algorithm and the guidelines, this will be one of those cases where your parameters, some of these parameters, you know, the, the LV size looks like it, the LA looks big, the LV, at least on that, looked like it wasn't that big. Uh, you've got a question of the mitral valve leaflets. You know, all these numbers are kind of all over the place, right? It's hard, I think, to be able to do PISA when you've got a very eccentric jet like this. And so I think this is a case where, you know, I think it, it certainly can, can stress people out. Uh, I think when you've got uh, information that is, doesn't kind of all line up in one direction or the other, that's an example, I think, where, where people uh, at our institution will refer a patient on for a CMR study. And so if you look at the CMR scan, I mean, you can see obviously it looks like the LV is actually dilated. And it looks like there is some malcoaptation, as Roberta alluded to, uh, at the mitral valve leaflet. And the key here is, you know, what we want to try to do, obviously, is one is quantify the severity of the MR, and we want to do it in a purely volumetric fashion. We're just simply saying, what's the amount of volume that's going backward across the mitral valve? In addition to that, you want to try to uh, provide some insights into the mechanism of the MR, uh, as well as identify the consequences of the MR 
on the, the heart by looking at LA volumes and LV volumes. So, so here's what this study, and this again is using our phase contrast, which is similar to uh, echo Doppler technique. Uh, and this is actually a phase contrast that's placed at the mitral annulus level. And you can see, we see this very eccentric jet that's coming back towards us. Right, so the white here is a mitral inflow, but you see the black mitral regurgitation jet. So, and this actually is a series of, of uh, views that are obtained at all slightly different uh, 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 anatomic orientation to try to again interrogate the mitral valve leaflets. And you can see there seems to be a problem with the coaptation uh, of that anterior leaflet, which seems to come back a little bit. All right, and you've got a very eccentric posteriorly directed jet. So let's look at the numbers. So when we go through and quantify the end diastolic and end systolic volumes, that allows us to determine what the stroke volume is. So in this patient, interestingly, the LV end diastolic volume was 331 mLs. End systolic was 155, giving us a stroke volume here of 176 mLs. So you've got really a very high LV stroke volume. Now, how much of that is going out the aorta? Because we know the way we solve for this is basically saying, how much is this ventricle ejecting out with each cardiac cycle? How much of that is going forward by measuring the, by phase contrast at the level of the uh, ascending aorta? And in this case, 93 mLs was going forward and that means that 83 mLs has got to be going backward. If this ventricle is, is pumping out 176 mLs, only 93 of that is going forward, then you've got a significant amount that's going backward into the left atrium. And uh, you know, the, the one unique thing about this technique is because you're simply just comparing volumes, is it really doesn't matter if you have changing degrees of MR severity throughout systole. Uh, it doesn't matter if there's eccentric jets or if you've got mobile mitral regurgitant lesions. Um, so, in this case, you know, the findings here by the CMR would suggest, one, there's severe MR, 93 ml regurgent volume with a fraction of 47%, severe LV dilatation with an end diastolic volume of 331, and severe LA dilatation with a uh, LV volume, in fact, that's uh, 280 mLs. All right, so this person actually went on to surgery, and what you notice after surgery uh, after mitral valve repair is that you can see now here there's a mitral ring, annual plastic ring in place. The mitral regurgitation is almost completely gone, but also interestingly is if you look at the size of the ventricle before to the size of the ventricle after surgery, you've got a significant reduction in the size of the left ventricular volume. So you've got si significant LV reverse remodeling that's occurred after this mitral valve intervention. Pardon me? Uh, this, yeah, this is a different case here. Yeah. Right. The, the other one, you, yeah. But it, so, so what I'm showing you here is the fact that one of the things you want to look at is reverse LV remodeling. That's one of the markers that we're going to look at as a sign of, of accuracy. The other thing also is if you look at uh, reproducibility of your measurements, if you compare in this particular study uh, the reproducibility of measurements for uh, mitral regurgitation assessment by CMR, uh, was fairly tight between two different readers as well as between the same reader. But again, we know that reproducibility alone is not sufficient. What you really want is accuracy. Um, and so the question is, what do we use to determine accuracy? One of the things you can use is, is look at LV reverser modeling. And then the other thing you want to look at is uh, prediction of outcomes. So let me just go through some of the data. Uh, that looked at LV re reverse remodeling, and this is a, a study that was published in JAK last year, which looked at the magnitude of reverse remodeling that happens after mitral valve repair, and it showed that the baseline uh, mitral regurgitant volume by CMR correlated pretty tightly with the magnitude of reverse LV remodeling that was seen uh, on follow-up about six months after the surgery. Uh, and in fact, had a, had a tighter correlation by CMR than it did by mitral regurgitation assessment by echocardiography, by mitral regurgitation volume assessment. Now, and so in, in that particular study, the authors went on to conclude that CMR seems to be uh, uh, very good at predicting ventricular response to surgery, uh, and again, using that as one pot potential surrogate for accuracy of assessment of mitral regurgitation severity. Now the other thing I think that's, that's probably more important is prediction of adverse outcome. Now that's where 
I, I think it gets hard because in, in today's era, we're obviously not going to have any natural history studies where people are going to uh, just be managed uh, you know, with observation alone. And so the question, at least in this study out of England, they try to address this in a very elegant fashion by basically doing serial CMRs on patients and blinded the results of the CMR scan. And then they want to look to see at what severity of, of mitral regurgitation uh, do, do patients go on to get surgery uh, in follow-up. And again, they censored patients that underwent surgery within the first couple months after the initial study, with the idea being that those are patients that might be uh, already planned to undergo surgery. So, the idea, so they're looking really to see patients that, that go on to get late surgery. And what they found was that using a regurgitant volume cutoff of 55 ml, so very similar to the 60 ml cutoff that's used by echocardiography, it actually pr provided pretty good discrimination between those patients that continued with medical therapy versus those patients that either uh, did not survive or that went on to uh, have a, a class one indication to get uh, mitral valve surgery, uh, either symptoms or significant LV dilatation. But again, not based on the CMR findings because they were blinded to the results of the CMR. And also by regurgitant fraction, what they found was that regurgitant fraction of less than 40% seemed to identify a group of patients that do fairly well with conservative therapy. And regurgitant fraction of 50% uh, identified a group of patients that are very likely to have poor outcome or to need surgery. And then those with a regurgitant fraction of 40 to 50, those that we think of as a 3 plus MR, uh, had a worse outcome but not as bad as those with a regurgitant fraction of more than 50%. In addition to that, they also show that LV volumes in and of itself uh, in, in these patients with isolated mitral valve disease uh, was also a predictor uh, in that those who had an LV end diastolic volume index of greater than 100 were more likely to, go, to have bad outcome or need surgery. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind, obviously, though, that this is a group of patients with isolated primary mitral regurgitation. And so we want to be careful uh, when we're talking about secondary MR or people with multiple valve disease where volumes alone may not be predictive. Um, and in fact, in this study, they also showed that using an ER cutoff of 0 0.4 by echocardiography uh, was, was also a predictor, but not as, as strong of a predictor as these other CMR parameters for identifying patients that are likely to go on to get uh, late surgery performed. Now, um, this actually was, was looking at uh, the combined value of looking at echo findings as well as CMR findings. And, and in the study, the, the two groups on the top here are those patients who had a CMR regurgitant volume of less than 55 mLs. And what they found was that for patients with a regurgitant volume of less than 55 mLs, uh, whether the echo grading was moderate or severe, the overall prognosis was, was not too bad. Whereas for patients with a regurgitant fraction of greater than 55 mLs, uh, whether the echo grading was moderate or severe, the outcome was, was worse in these patients in the sense either wor uh, reduced survival or need for uh, mitral valve repair. Now, the other thing obviously that we want to try to do with CMR is also look at mechanism of the abnormality and again, the objective here is going to be, or the, the mechanism by the, uh, the methodology by this is going to be do a series of high res views of the mitral valve uh, where you can identify this patient here who has Barlow's, the patient here who has uh, repair with a posterior leaflet pro prolapse that's residual, uh, and this person here who has a nice normal mitral valve uh, coaptation. Um, and then the, the way that this is done, again, is by, by doing a series of uh, three chamber views up and down the ventricle. So you can really interrogate each of the individual scallops. The, in this case, the A1P1, in this case, the A2P2 scallop, and in this case, the A3P3 scallop. Uh, and this was a study published a few years ago which looked at the uh, ability to identify a uh, primary leaflet abnormality. Uh, and what it found was that CMR and TE compared fairly closely with each other. Uh, and in this study, the, the, the gold standard here were surgical findings, uh, but the one area where, where T performed better was in depicting uh, torn chordae. And the reason for that is if you have small, very mobile structures, with CMR uh, acquiring the images over multiple cardiac cycles, you're going to have a challenge with identifying uh, uh, ruptured chordae. Now, the, the other uh, advantage, obviously, is the ability to look at the ventricle itself in the, in the setting of secondary MR, and here is using the delayed uh, gadolinium enhancement CMR technique where you can find there's evidence of an infarction here in the infralateral wall, 
And you can see on this patient, there's a tethering of that posterior leaflet uh, resulting in the mitral regurgitation. And then you've got another patient over here who has a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, no light gadolinium enhancement on the CMR, and you can see just a dilated annulus leading to uh, secondary mitral regurgitation. So because the, the methodology here is purely based on volumetrics, uh, really it doesn't matter if you're dealing with a prosthetic valve because you're simply comparing the volume of, of or the stroke volume out of the left ventricle compared to the aortic outflow. Uh, and so in, in the setting, the presence of a prosthetic valve, the presence of a mitral clip doesn't really alter the mechanism or the methodology by which you do your, your mitral regurgitation severity assessment. Um, and in, in addition to that, uh, this comparison of LV stroke volume to the aortic outflow actually also works if there's coexisting AI. And the reason for that is that the aortic regurgitation will increase your LV stroke volume because as that flow comes backward, it's going to get ejected back out. So the LV stroke volume goes up, but it also increases your aortic forward flow as well. And so as a result, the, the difference between your LV stroke volume and your, your uh, aortic forward flow isn't really altered. The, the two values cancel themselves out. And so this methodology works uh, in the setting of coexisting AI as well. And, and here's what the, uh, so the guidelines, the ACC uh, 2014 guidelines uh, recommend the role for CMR in patients, you know, for, for mitral regurgitation. It's indicated in patients with chronic primary MR to assess LV and RV volumes and MR severity uh, when issues are not satisfactorily addressed by transthoracic echo. And then they go on to suggest that there's a role for CMR uh, in the setting of secondary mitral regurgitation where you want to assess myocardial viability, which may influence both your management uh, or may influence your management of functional mitral regurgitation. So obviously in the interest of time, I'm going to just touch you know, briefly on tricuspid regurgitation because the reality is the, the data behind the role of CMR in tricuspid regurgitation is fairly limited. Uh, and as Steve touched on, the data in general with regard to tricuspid regurgitation uh, is fairly limited. The basic way that we would uh, assess TR severity, in fact, is, is very similar to the way you would do mitral regurg severity. The only difference being you're going to do RV stroke volume compared to pulmonary artery outflow. So RVOT or PA outflow, and then simply compare the difference between those two to determine what's the volume of blood that's being ejected backward. Okay, so this kind of summarizes uh, where CMR may be helpful in the setting of valvular regurgitation. And I think obviously in cases where there's a discrepancy between the physical exam and 2D echo Doppler findings, uh, when you've got suboptimal echo windows, when you've got multiple jets, when you want to get an assessment of uh, valve morphology, uh, volumes and ejection fraction, uh, and then obviously uh, in, in paravalvular regurgitation and in eccentric uh, regurgitant jets as well. Thank you for your attention.